Um, welcome to um, the live Q&A session for the Family Nurse Practitioner Program at Frontier Nursing University. So we're so glad that you're here. We're going to go through some slides and give you an opportunity to meet different people, faculty and staff at Frontier, and then an opportunity to ask questions. So one of our tenets, one of the things that we really believe in is creating a culture of caring at Frontier Nursing University. I'm Dr. Lisa Chapel, the chair for the Department of Family Nursing. And with me is... Hi, I'm so glad you guys are here. Um, I'm Catherine Arterberry. I'm the clinical director for the Family Nurse Practitioner Program. And I'd like to introduce Ms. Jamie Wheeler. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie. I'm one of the clinical advisors here. So I look forward to helping you on this journey. And we have Karen Brumbreck. Um, hi, I'm Karen Brumbach. I am the admissions officer for letters D through HI, and I'm happy to be here and happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Is there any other faculty or staff here that we need to introduce? Okay, not hearing anybody, we'll move ahead. <clears throat> the purpose of the family the Department of Family Nursing at Frontier is to prepare family nurse practitioners to care for families residing in rural or other underserved areas by offering a structured off-campus community-based family nurse practitioner specialty track. And in um, this photo, you see one of the traditions at Frontier, which is a circle up where students join together and share the reflections and kind of a bonding um, time for students. At Frontier, we do um, create and care for and nurture a culture of caring, caring between faculty and students and faculty to faculty. And this is kind of a motto that we live by that we truly care for each other and particularly the students. You use your community as a classroom. Our, it is, we are online and you will work from home. And uh, there are two times that you will be um, asked to come to campus. One time when you begin the program for orientation in a session called Frontier Bound. And then about halfway through the program, you'll come to campus for a clinical intensive called Clinical Bound. And we believe that those two times on campus are really strength of our program where students are physically together with each other and their faculty. Um, we do have a brand new campus in Versailles, Kentucky, and we'll have some pictures in just a few minutes. Uh, some of the achievements of Frontier, we have over 80 years of experience of graduate nursing in midwifery and in midwifery education. We have students and alumni in every of the 50 states. We have 2,500 current enrolled students and over 8,000 graduates. So we are a very strong growing school. Some of our achievements, we received uh, the best online program in graduate nursing 2020. We were recognized. We've also received um, a, as a national leader in the DEI and for a four time winner of the Insight is Diversity Higher Education Excellence in Diversity. Dr. Arterberry will speak about diversity, equity, and inclusion at Frontier, but it is a very important program and way of being for us. And then Front FNU received an International Distant Learning Award by the United States Distant Learning Association. So we are an award-winning university and the FNP program is an award-winning program. For this year, 2020, the FNP program was ranked third in US News and World Report for online family nurse practitioners program. We were the first nurse, family nurse practitioner program in the United States beginning in 1970. We um, celebrated our 50th anniversary, the FMP program in 2020, and our FMP graduates have an overall certification pass rate of 97%, which is an objective measure of the quality of a program. So we do very, very well. Our students do very, very well on the certification exam. 
from what Dr. Chapel was saying, you can really tell we know how to do what we do. Um, and one of the things that we also do well is provide support for our students. Um, you are the reason that we are here doing what we do. And these are just some of the members of the team that are there to support you. I'm clinically focused as the clinical director. So there are regional clinical faculty um, who work with the preceptors that you have to make sure your clinical experience is on point. You have academic advisors who take you through the process leading um, through your didactic coursework, clinical advisors, which we have here today that you will hear from in just a minute. Teamwork, we are all about teamwork to make sure that you have what you need. There are also online student support and mentoring groups. Um, a lot of online programs, students feel isolated, but we give you ample opportunity to um, communicate and integrate with your, um, your class or your group. Of course, we have financial aid and scholarships. We have an online library that has everything you need to make it through this program. And of course, another big uh, push here, um, and you can see that by the awards that Dr. Chapel mentioned is the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Jamie for her to talk a little bit about some more student support. All right, hi everyone. So like Dr. Artiberry said, I am one of the clinical advisors here. So when you would come to orientation, this is called Frontier Bound, you would um, listen in to one of our sessions where we talk a lot about the different tools and resources we have for you. One of those tools is our community map. So you'd get to see where past students have had clinical experiences. Um, our unit also does lots of webinars each term on clinical search strategies and tips and tools. And then we're happy to meet with you individually as well. We know everyone has different situations and circumstances in life, and we really enjoy that one-on-one -on -one, um, support to get to know you better as well. So we look forward to working with you and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Jamie. And Jamie doesn't just talk the talk, she really walks the walk. So you will enjoy getting to know her and working with her as you go through your program. Um, just a little bit more about the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, big buzzwords right now, but Frontier has been on the front line of this for a long time. And our goal is that every student that comes in is treated fairly, um, who ha have a sense of an inclusion and a sense of belonging. That the goal of the DEI office is to make sure, not just students, but this is true for faculty and staff, that we encourage everyone to feel like they are members of the um, community. Um, and when you talk about that belonging, that's where the mentoring, the tutoring, the writing support, your coaches, your team that works for you, anti-racism and bias advisory council and all of those things and special interest groups where you can get together with people with like interest. And you can see we put a focus on it because it was one of those award-winning things that um, FNU has been uh, recognized for. You'll have an opportunity to see to participate in a diversity impact program. Um, there's a portal page and lots of support in that area to make sure when you leave FNU, you are a member of the FNU community. Thank you, Dr. Artiberry. Um, audience, a couple of degrees that we offer, we offer the MSN and we offer the FMP the Certified Nurse Midwife, Women's Health Nurse Practitioner, and Psych uh, Nurse Practitioner. We offer a postgraduate certificate, which is for someone who already has a certificate and certification in one area to come and add another certificate to their professional development. And we have the DMP program. Uh, for MSN entries, it, there is a direct admission process that starts with the MSN program and you move right into the DMP after completion of your MSN. 
the time frame options for our program, we exist on a term system at Frontier that a term is 11 weeks long with two weeks between each term. Uh, for the MSN, it will take two to three years, depending on the uh, number of courses you take and how you move to the program. For the PGC, the postgraduate certificate, it can take one to one and a half years. And for the DMP, and this is after you finish the MSN, it would be additional 15 to 18 months. So uh, the timelines are good. The curriculum is very well developed. And I will hand it over to Karen. Hello, everybody. Um, so our admissions criteria for the MSM program is that um, you have to um, have a current active US RN license with no encumbrances. Um, we also want you to have your either your BSM with a min minimum of a 3.0 GPA um, and um, sorry. Uh, you can also have your ADN with a minimum of a 3.0 GPA plus a bachelor's in another field. That would be a portfolio option. You just have one additional step to do um, if you have that situation. Um, your um, highest earned nursing degree must come from an accredited institution, both programmatically and um, regionally. Um, and you also have to have one year of RN experience. Um, we're pretty strict on that, um, but it's one year prior to the start of coursework. So if you're applying for um, fall term, the deadline um, is April 20th and um, the fall term starts on October 3rd. So you'd have to have one year of RN experience prior to that. Um, we, um, I see there's a little asterisk below about um, New York. Um, we allow um, residents from New York to apply to the DMP program. And we just recently allowed um, applicants from New York to apply to their MSN and PGC programs. However, you would have to do your clinical uh, practicum outside of the state of New York. So that's our new kind of stipulation there. Um, postgraduate certificates, um, kind of the, the similar, um, similar there. Um, you have to have a current U.S. Um, RN license active with no, un no encumbrances. If you have your APRN, you also need to maintain an RN license in conjunction with that. We require that. Some states don't, um, but we would have you renew that. Um, and so you would have to have a 3.0 in your highest earned nursing degree, which for this would be your master's, your MSN. Um, and you could um, have your MSN in one of the following specialties listed on the screen. Um, we don't, we prefer that you have your APR in, but it's not required at this time. Um, but your specialty has to be in one of those, um, one of those um, specialties listed there. Um, so we've currently um, extended our um, deadline for summer. You can um, apply for summer still. Um, it's um, the deadline to apply is March 23rd um, and you'd have to get all your materials together by then. Coursework will begin on July 4th. Um, and for fall, if you want to apply for fall, the deadline to apply and submit all your materials is April 20th, and you'll begin coursework on October 3rd. So to apply for the MSM program, you'd be required to submit an application online and pay the application fee. Then we will have you, um, we would ask that you submit your resume through professional references. Of those references, we want two to be supervisory and one to be a peer reference. Um, we would also need all your nursing transcripts and, um, what did I miss, a resume, three professional re references. Oh, and you'll be required to submit two essays. Um, so the first, you have a choice between what you'd want to write about, and then the second is a time management essay. And then if you have your um, ADN degree and a bachelor's in another field, you will be required to submit an additional portfolio. But if you have your BSN, that is not required. 
Um, so currently tuition is $636 per credit hour. Um, you'll wanna check the website for updates. Thank you, Karen. That's a lot of good information and we'll definitely have that available for you to review. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your clinical experience. How it's 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 really an important part of how we became the number three FMP program in the country. And I just have to put in a plug, we are a bargain compared to numbers one and two. Okay. Um, but a great bargain. So for clinical experience in the MSN program, you'll be required to complete 675 clinical hours. Um, and normally, if you go full time, which would be go to clinical full time, 40 hours a week, it's going to take you at least 16 weeks to complete your clinical experience. But we do allow flexibility in how you go through clinical. Um, you must do at least 20 hours a week. So you can extend if you lessen the number of hours per week you do, it will prolong the time it takes you to complete. OK, um, and that's a great thing also is that you can kind of tailor your clinical experience to what fits in with your schedule. If you're a PGC, if you already have an APRN and another um, specialty, then it's 540 hours. We give you credit for your first clinical course. So it leaves you with 540 minimum clinical hours for you to get it. full time is 14 weeks of clinical. Um, I just have to say, though, that that is your number of hours. We also have competencies and site visit types that you have to meet, but we feel like you can really meet them within that number of hours. The companion DMP, you add an additional 360 clinical hours, and we feel like you'll be really prepared to be a novice uh, practitioner with this type of clinical uh, experience. Um, and I just said the FMP clinical requirements are competency based. You'll start hearing those words as you buzzwords as you look at certain programs. We want you to be able to do certain things when you complete. Um, and the experience, of course, in an FMP program is across the lifespan. So it's from infants all the way to geriatrics. That's what an FMP does. So we will provide you with those experiences across the lifespan. Thank you, Dr. Arterberry. Um, I hope that you're starting to get the feel that Frontier is a unique university. And one of the things that makes it unique is the team approach that we take to caring for students. So as a student, you would have a team of people that would work with you and monitor and be a resource for you as you work through the program. Some examples of our team include myself as department chair, Dr. Arterberry as our clinical director. Each course has a course coordinator who's the lead faculty in the course. And course faculty, uh, the number depends on how many students are in the course, but they work as a team to teach the students and lead the students through the course. We have other faculty called regional clinical faculty. These faculty are the um, center of the clinical experience at Frontier, and they work with you as you come through your preceptorship hours and help you grow and learn and become extremely competent clinicians. The academic advisor system at Frontier is very well developed. Each student has an academic advisor that works with them and advises them through the clinical courses. Clinical advisor, you've met Ms. Jamie Quiller and we have great clinical advisors that also help you through the clinical part of the program. The financial aid office, um, is another important part of Frontier. And then the credentialing coordinator is um, a department that is extremely important. And you'll see the pictures here on the right is myself and Dr. Arterberry. In the middle is uh, Robbie Morton, who's one of the academic advisors. And then on the left is Ms. Jody Dickey, who's the credentialing coordinator. So you would have a team of people to work with you and bring you through the program. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have a new campus in Versailles, Kentucky. 
One of the neat things about this campus is that it's six miles from the Bluegrass Airport in Kentucky. So we're very close to airport. But let's take a look at these pictures. On the top left hand is the student dorm. We call them the student lodges. And this is where students stay when they come to campus for the frontier bound and the clinical bound experiences we mentioned. Um, the, we have a welcome center. This is the, the next picture over and then the next picture where student events happen and students come at when they initially arrive, arrive on campus. And you'll see the campus itself is very beautiful. They had a lot of older trees on the campus that were saved that really gives it a great, great feeling. We have um, buildings for, um, for orientation and for education. And we also have buildings for clinical the clinical time that students are on campus. So one of the things that we're extremely proud of is the work that our alumni do. And I wanna just take a couple of minutes and highlight some of our former students so that you can see what they're doing since they left Frontier. Charles, De my goodness. Hold on just a minute, let me back up. All right, let's try this again. Charles Davis, who is one of our FMP graduates, developed and led an initiative to open an in-school health clinic. And this was in uh, Northern New York State. And you can see Charles there working with coworkers to establish and run the school-based clinic. The other student I'd like to show you is Julian Williams, who's also an FMP graduate. And he um, answered the call on FEMA assignment. So he worked works with FEMA in Brooklyn with um, caring for people who are in disaster areas. And let's see, Julian, there's Julian. Two of our excellent graduates. Um, that's two men, we need to see a female graduate, don't we? Okay, let's look at Patty. Patty Coldiron feels urgent need with urgent care. She is in Harlan County, Kentucky, and she um, developed and operates an urgent care clinic in Harlan County, Kentucky. So you see we have students all across the United States who are doing just a real variety of things based on their interests, but with the foundation of their education here at Frontier. All right, life as an FMP. Dr. Arterberry, what do you um, what have you enjoyed best about being an FMP? Why do you why do you think it is is the thing to do? Uh, thank you, Dr. Chapel. I think one of my um, most rewarding things about being an FMP is that I can impact community health for right in the community where I am. We are representative of multiple communities here. I have worked in private practice. I have owned my own clinic. And now I do a lot of work at a free clinic in my area. And I know that me personally, and those stories that you just heard shows the impact that an FMP can have in the community. And that is just, um, a few of the stories that happen. And that's kind of what fuels us to get you guys in here and get you out there into your community because it is just awesome the number of stories we get and about how FMPs impact the care that happens in their community. We're the solution. I'm pretty sure about that. We're wow. the solution to the health care crisis. You're the I, solution. <laughs> I agree, Dr. Arterberry. One of the things that I have enjoyed most about being a family nurse practitioner, and Dr. Ari Berry and I have been nurse practitioners, FMPs, 27 and 28 years. Do I have that right, Dr. Ari Berry? Okay. One of the things that I enjoyed most is the versatility of the role. You would be prepared to care for patients from birth to geriatrics, both genders. You would care for um, the well patient, doing well exams, well wellness teaching. 
You would be prepared to take care of episodic illnesses like minor illnesses, minor injury, but you're also prepared to take care of chronic illness, which, as you know, is a big need. Oh, in, is, a big, is, a, is a big need in the United States. So I like the versatility of the role, and I've been able to use that in several settings over the years that I've been at FMP, and it has been so very rewarding to have the knowledge to be able to impact different populations and different age groups. And here's a quote. Um, if you don't know Marva Collins, go and Google her and read about her. She is an African-American educator who really developed a lot of solid teaching approaches um, during her work as an educator. But here's a quote from Ms. Collins. Success doesn't come to you, you go to it. And this is one of our FNU graduates celebrating her graduation. So success doesn't come to you, you go to it. All right, let's stop right here and see if there's any questions. Um, you have a, a nice group of people here at missions, clinical advising, myself and Dr. Arterberry, where we could answer any questions, turn your microphone on or put your question in the chat box. We'd love to be able to help you. Yes, hi, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Jennifer and I have a question regarding the orientation when you have to go to the facility. How many days is that? It is two and a half days. And we typically go from Monday um, midday till Wednesday afternoon. Perfect. And then once you have to go back and do the one week, uh, that's the whole entire week? It is. It runs from Sunday midday until the following Friday midday. And okay. students, uh, the housing, I showed you the student lights, that's where students stay. We have a brand new cafeteria. So everything that you need is taken care of. You have a place to sleep. You have three meals a day. And you have our nice new buildings, education and clinical building to work in. And Jennifer, let me just say that that time on campus is packed full of learning. You will come out of there feeling very prepared to start your actual clinical um, on-site training when you leave clinical bound. It is fantastic um, for working on skills. Um, it is it's just, it's a great experience. Is it a simulation lab? There, had, there is simulation there. There are standardized patients there. Um, they, it is an awesome experience. And the added thing is that you get a chance to meet your classmates. And I always say that when I came through my nurse practitioner program, some of my best uh, collaborators in the future were the classmates I had when I came through. Um, so I think that is an important thing. Um, to note that when you come to campus, it allows you that opportunity. Thank you. And one more question regarding the clinical hours. Um, just wanted to clarify that you can, uh, there is flexibility with that. If you have, you know, a Monday through Friday job and you can only do a certain amount of hours, you can allow that. It's just that it would take longer to complete the program, correct? There is an allowance for that to a certain extent. I don't want you to be in school until my 10 year old granddaughter graduates from high school. <laughs> So that you do have to um, come at least 20 hours a week. So that is important to start thinking about that now for how you want to do that. But it is flexible. Perfect. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat box, Dr. Artiberry. What is a student to faculty ratio? Well, the ratio really depends on where you are in the program. If you're in the didactic courses that are up front in the curriculum, then the ratio can be one to 30, one to 50, depending on how many faculty are assigned to the course. When you come to clinical bound, the clinical intensive is a one to six ratio. And then when you go to your clinical preceptorships and you're working with RCFs, Dr. Artiberry, am I right in saying it's one to 10 or one to 20? It might be more, it is in that range, 10 to 20. Okay. 
and that does uh, encompass students at, at different points in the program. Um, so you have you get a lot of attention. You won't come through here as a um, and slide through without anybody knowing who you are. So, Dr. Arterberry is right. We are very hands on. We expect to have interaction and engagement with the students. And I think that students learn best when they are working with their faculty and know their faculty and they have faculty to help them achieve the objectives of any course. So we're very hands-on with students. What other questions might there be? Okay, let's talk a minute about- hey, This is Peta, I have a question. Sure. Do you have to be fully vaccinated to attend yes. the program? Front, yes, Frontier now has the requirement that to be on campus, everyone, and that's faculty, staff, and students have to have received the vaccine. Yes, we do. Is there- Thank you. Following up on that question, is there like an exemption, a medical religious exemption that you can, uh, you know, um, or it has to be that you have to have the vaccine? Um, you can apply for an exemption, but right now we're staying pretty steady with everyone has to be vaccinated. Um, and that includes all faculty and staff. And we really are following the CDC guidelines as far as having everybody come into campus together from all over the United States. And I'm finding as clinical director, students are having a difficult time finding a site to do their um, hours in if they're not vaccinated. And so we, what we don't want is for you to get all the way up through pediatrics and you can't find a place to do your pediatrics um visits so it's we're looking out for um the health of the community meaning the fnu community um but yeah that's the policy right now i see another question that i can answer in the chat box um can we use mds and do's and fmps for our preceptors yes you can um if and you feels like the best person to teach you to be an advanced practice nurse is who? An advanced practice nurse. But you can do up to 40% of your hours with an MD or D, uh, DO um, because there are colleagues and you can learn things from them. Absolutely. But the majority of your hours will be with an advanced practice nurse, whether you're doing P's with a PMP, um, you know, clinicals with an FMP or a women's health MP for your women's health hours or however you want to do it. And there's a question right above that. Karen, I think you would be the best to answer that question. How long is the application process after you submit your application? Okay, so after you've submit your application and you have to do it prior to the deadline, um, we say we've got a rolling admissions process that is fairly new. So it used to be that everybody found out at once um, when they were admitted. Now it's kind of on a um, sort of rolling basis. So um, we say probably about four weeks um, after you've submitted your application, you should hear something, um, maybe a little sooner. Um, it just depends. It's a pretty good turnaround. Um, there is, Dr. Arterberry, here's a question that you can answer. Are you responsible for finding your own clinical site? And I think I'm going to let Jamie start with that. She answered it because Jamie is very a very critical part in helping students find those clinical sites. I see that. Sure. Thank you. So that's a good question. So yes, ultimately, students are responsible for finding their own clinical placements, but you are not alone in this process. So um, you have me as your clinical advisor, you will be assigned to an RCF. So that's a faculty member who typically lives in the same region where you do. And um, we put lots of webinars on each term, we have individual meetings with you, we have group advising sessions. Um, so there's lots of support out there and we'll teach you how to use the tools like our community map 
which has well over 10,000 sites and past preceptors on there. And that will be one of the tools we teach you how to use during Frontier Bound. And the benefit to you um, finding your own locations is you really get to make the experience yours. So we don't tell you you have to go here, here, and here. You get to piece those things together to what's going to be meaningful for you and how you want to, um, you know, thinking about what type of position you want when you graduate. So we're here to help you through it. Thank you, Jamie. Excellent. Are there yes, any more? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have one more question. What is your acceptance rate as far as when you apply, you know, um, percentage? Um, prior to the start of the um, pandemic, it was about 50%. Um, since the pandemic, that number has gone up um, because we have not seen as many um, people applying, but the number is uh, starting to go back down because we're getting more applicants. Um, so. And it please. also varies by program too, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add in there, please don't let that keep you from applying. Absolutely. Um, if you meet the criteria, put your application in, you are applying for a program that has proven excellence that help, um, you know, our pass rates show that we do what we need to do. So please don't let that stop you from applying. And now that it's on that rolling admission, you'll know, you'll know pretty soon after you apply. Um, Dr. Hardyberry, that was really sound advice. If you meet the criteria for admission, please apply. We would love to see you admitted and coming through our program. Um, let's talk about resiliency for just a minute. You know, resiliency is a trait that nurses often have. It's defined as adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. Well, graduate school can be a source of, accept, success, of stress, but we are resilient. This is something that is very achievable. Uh, the picture that you see on the left is the president of FNU, Dr. Susan Stone, and on the right is a recent graduate receiving his diploma. And Dr. Arterberry, I believe I'm handing it to you. And so it, you've learned a lot about the program this evening. You've seen some of your team members who will be working with you. So hopefully you have a feel for what FNU is. Um, you can't get the whole feel till you come, but hopefully you've get, gotten a little taste of what we're about. So now the ball is in your court. My granddaughter is a, is a tennis player. The ball is in your court. Um, so based on the information that you have, go to frontier.edu, check us out, um, look at what the program is about. And uh, that might not be the right analogy, but pull the trigger. <laughs> Ready, set, jump, okay? Go ahead and um, get that application filled out. If you have any questions, you know, you see we're here all in the evening just for you you know, from all over the different parts of the United States, we're here um, to make sure you have the information you need. So I look forward to seeing some of these names I see on here um, come through as uh, newly admitted students. <laughs>